you'll take note that some of the Bible texts that pop up today are some of the very same ones that uh, Andrew used last week, simply because uh, the true God is the Creator, and so some of those very same verses will appear. Um, the sheets I've given you are a pretty shortened version of the things I'm going to be looking at here, um, except for what you have on the back, which uh, is exactly what I'll have on my sheet here from the implications when we get toward the end of time. The Apostle Paul spoke to those folks in Lystra. Um, we recall in Acts 14, um, as a speaker, they thought he was probably Hermes. They honored um, Barnabas as Zeus. If you know in Acts 14, verse 15, Paul said, the living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. So, uh, they, they confused, clearly, um, who Paul and Barnabas were, so much so in the Lyconian language, which neither Paul nor Barnabas understood, but they figured it out from the body language, apparently, that they were about to sacrifice to them as gods and stop, stop them from doing that, made clear to them that they were, of course, just men like they were. In the 17th chapter of Acts, which Andrew also referred to last week, Paul makes uh, the statement that God who made the world and everything in it. Gentiles in the ancient world were typically polytheist, worshiping a pantheon of gods. Some of us have read Roman or Greek mythology, and we're aware of some of those various gods that they worshipped. They believed that they had evolved out of natural processes. Uh, they were flawed. They had many of them, these gods, human characteristics. You think of Neptune, Minerva, Mars, Venus, Apollo, Diana, and so on. Jack Lewis maintains, correctly, I believe, that the biblical concept of creation uh, is not only significant for us in opposing idolatry where people worship the creature rather than the creator, which is what Paul says goes on in Romans 1, but it's also cruci crucial in determining the behavior of every person and additionally in determining what a person thinks about himself. been a number of years ago, but you recall, so many of you no doubt, these uh, posters and maybe they were bumper stickers and, and other de decals that said simply, God doesn't make junk. All right? Uh, I recall one that we had when our kids were small. You're special. God doesn't make junk. That's absolutely the truth, of course. Uh, that's what the psalmist tells us in Psalm 139, that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And so creation underscores the great power of God. S Psalm 33, verse 9, For He spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood forth. This is creation by decree. Oswald Alice, in his little uh, commentary, on the Pentateuch uses the expression creation by fiat, not the car, <laughs> but by command. All right? God commands and it happens. Second Peter 3, verse 5, By the word of God, heavens existed long ago and an earth formed out of water. And so as our Bible starts in Genesis 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that idea is stressed all throughout Scripture. And uh, Lewis does an amazing job because he gives the Scripture all the way through. Uh, I'm going to um, read a lot of it, but you'll find more of it uh, if you buy the book or get the book. For example, in Psalm 8, a pretty well-known text for many of us, Psalmist looking to the starry skies, when I consider the heavens, the work of your hands, uh, the moon and the stars that you've set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? The psalmist clearly believed in creation. Or in Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and he established it upon the waters. Or Psalm 33, verse 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, 
their starry host by the breath of his mouth. Or Psalm 95 and verse 5. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Psalm 100, which we often connect with thanksgiving, verse 3 says, Know that the Lord is God, it is he who made us, and we are his. We're the sheep of his pasture. Or Psalm 104, and by the way, Psalm 104 is what many uh, students of the Psalms call a, call a creation psalm because in every verse there's some aspect of creation uh, talked about. But let me just read one verse. Verse 24 of Psalm 104. How many are your works, O Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. The prophet Amos speaks of God who forms the mountains and creates the wind. Amos 4.13. Jonah in chapter 1 and verse 9 claims to be a worshiper of the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Isaiah, in at least three passages, makes reference to creation. I'll read 43, 6, and 7. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Creation, forming, making, all words that are often used to describe uh, the work that God did in creation. Three times in the book of Job at least, uh, Job makes reference to creation. Job 33 will be the verse I read, 33.3, My words come from an upright heart. My lips sincerely speak what I know. The Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. When we come to the New Testament, uh, we find it often again. We find it in John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so verse 3 speaks of all things being made through the Word. The Word, of course, is identified in verse 14 of John 1. The Word became flesh and lived among us. We beheld His glory, glory as the only begotten of the Father. And so we, we learn that in, in the uh, pre-incarnate, we would say Christ, He was called the Word, which makes me ponder personally if the second member of the Godhead wasn't heavily involved in creation as He spoke it into existence. In Romans 4.17, Paul speaks concerning God who calls into existence the things that do not exist. And so the idea is introduced that this God is a God who made something out of nothing. Hebrews 11, verse 3, which appears, I think, on your sheet as well. By faith we understand that the word was a world was created by the word of God so that what is seen was made out of things which do not appear. Revelation 4 verse 11, speaking of God, you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. And so Lewis floats the idea that belief in creation is not an insignificant matter it has implications for us as human beings. When Genesis 1 tells us uh, that God said, uh, according to my count, he says it eight times in chapter 1. And there are three different Hebrew words, which appear on your sheet as well, that are used for God's creative activity. All right? For the word create, we have the Hebrew word bara. For the word, or, uh, this would be the verb form, yatsar, and for the word make, asa. We use the word create, interesting, uh, quite different in our language than the Hebrews would have understood it. For the Hebrews in ancient times, create was a word reserved totally for God who could make something out of nothing. When my wife orders a fat quarter, those of you who are quilters know what that is, 
from Missouri Star Quilt Company and lays it out and organizes the colors and puts it together, it might not be uncommon at all for her to say, hey, come look at my new creation. All right? In the sense of the Hebrew word, she has not created. She has taken something and formed it or made it. God, however, is in the business of, yeah, of creating. There's a Babylonian creation myth called the Enuma Elish, which uh, Lewis makes reference to at one point. He said the, the Babylonians projected forms of matter, seawater, fresh water, and the mist, and they saw them as eternal. There are some people today who want to believe in eternally existing matter that deity merely worked on. But the view of many early believers, among them Augustine of Hippo, was that uh, the creation that God was involved in was a creation, as noted, as out of nothing into something. He is the only eternally existing one. He is from everlasting to everlasting. Matter is not. Matter has a beginning and it has an end, which is a big difference for some people in our world who would like to see matter as eternal and the, uh, the happenings in our world is simply circular, the circle of life. Uh, it's not that at all. It's linear. There was a beginning and there will be an end and God's in charge. In the early second century, the Gnostics came along proposing that God was a spirit who could not come into any kind of essential contact with matter. Um, and that affected, of course, their view of, of Jesus. Uh, some of those Gnostics believed, well, he may, have been, he may have been God up until the crucifixion, but certainly not uh, in, in death. Uh, the Gnostics had the world being made by a power that they called the Demiurge. Again, the book of Genesis affirms for us that the world that we live in is the result of God's work, not some second-rate impersonal force. Which kind of brings us up to the last 150 years or so where many people have been trying to explain the cosmos on a completely naturalistic basis. Uh, a popular view is the Big Bang Theory, where the world is just allegedly the outcome of an unguided explosion of gases millions of years ago. What set off that explosion of gases is never explained. Further, these folks uh, say that slowly life developed from non-life, and over great amounts of time, <clears throat> and I recall one of the guys from Apologetics Press saying this years ago, if you were to compare science textbooks of the late 40s and early 50s, there were a few million years involved, and now it's tons of years involved because uh, when you're dealing with randomness, you need more and more years uh, allegedly for these things to take place. And so if you look at a modern textbook, it, the, the, the alleged... Uh, amount of time is, is greatly more than what it was, say, 50, 60 years ago in these books. But to be honest, evolution is a faith system. Um, it's a hypothesis that has to be assumed. There's no evidence for spontaneous generation alleged to have occurred. Louis Pasteur showed us that a completely sterile environment produces nothing. Scientists have not been able to demonstrate life coming from non-life. We'd have to say one has to believe as much or I would say perhaps more to believe in evolution because no one was there when the alleged Big Bang occurred in order to document it. I guess we could say the same thing about creation. They're both systems of faith. One is more rational than the other, in my view. Something else, of course, that the evolutionists assume is that so-called acquired characteristics are transmitted to offspring 
And Lewis brings this up in a section of the book. And yet we know that acquired traits are not transmitted to the next generation. Uh, the example he brings in the book is that rats with tails cut off, gener generation after generation, still beget rats that have tails. All right. So let's come to some of the problems that people have with creation. Though some folks have thought in times past that a Bible believer was bound to a specific age for the earth, I suggest such is not really the case at all. For example, some of you may have owned one of these. I think I had one at one time with a center, center column reference where at the start of Genesis 1, uh, the figure 4004 B.C. stood. That relates, of course, to this uh, Archbishop of Armagh, of the Church of Ireland, back in the 1600s, James Usher, uh, based his date on some assumptions that are highly questionable. Basically, he had taken some of the genealogies in Genesis, added them together, and come up with the figure uh, 4004 B.C. as the year of creation. But those dates in the Hebrew text, when you compare it with the Samaritan Pentateuch, and then further with the Greek versions uh, of the Pentateuch, are not the same. You also have to assume, and this is the major uh, issue in this whole discussion regarding dating and usher, you have to assume uh, that there are no skips or gaps in the genealogies. If you look at the genealogy of, of uh, Jesus and Matthew, you'll find that Matthew uh, has three groups of 14, or I guess uh, we might say six groups of seven. In Matthew 1, verse 8, the text says, Joram fathered Isaiah. When you compare uh, the Old Testament, you'll find he omits three generations. All who were descendants uh, of evil King Ahab. There's some theories as to why he may have done that. One of the reasons, I think, is that he wanted to come up with uh, three groups of 14. Uh, but there's also the idea that some have suggested that uh, these generations up to the fourth generation were, were merely left out because of how evil Ahab was and, and those who followed him. In any event, uh, we see that genealogies have issues uh, in the Old Testament. If you compare Ezra 7, verses 3 and 4, with 1 Chronicles 6, 6 through 10, you'll find that six names are omitted from Ezra's list that find their way into Chronicles. Okay? Uh, the expression son of in Hebrew is also somewhat problematic. When we think of son of, we think of an immediate father, but sometimes it's used to describe a grandfather or merely a forefather. <coughs> that being true, that there are often gaps then in these uh, genealogies because genealogies, genealogies are, are really concerned about lineage and uh, being from a certain tribe and so on and not to uh, an issue of, of giving us some kind of date by which we can date uh, creation. And so Usher's theory uh, was further problematic because he bought into the idea that one day with the Lord is a thousand years, and he took that quite literally from 2 Peter 3, verse 8. He maintained that the world would stand for 6,000 years. Four of those days, or 4,000 years, came before Christ and 2,000 would come after uh, after Christ walked the earth. And so he dated the creation at 4004 B.C. I've often why 4004, and I don't know the answer to that. I don't think anybody does. Uh, I guess it's possible that he was concerned about the switch between the Julian and Gregorian calendar, all right? Because most of you are aware that the birth of Jesus is dated either 4 B.C. or 4 to 6 B.C. because of the, the calendar swap and some errors that were made in calculation, all right? For a good many folks in our time then, the Darwinian theory of evolution is used to explain how things have come to be. And yet, when you look at the fossil record, it doesn't make the case 
for evolution, although they would like to say that it does. Dinosaurs clearly have a great deal of fascination for children, and that's exactly what Lewis says in this paragraph. And with them, <coughs> dinosaurs erroneously may be the most persuasive argument for evolution, but it's good for us to remember that the termination of certain species has been seen in our time as well. Uh, and the, the point he brings up is the disappearance of the passenger pigeon in the early part of the 20th century, but we could think of other uh, species that have become extinct. That there were once creatures alive, which we do not now have, no matter how strange those creatures may have been, does not establish the theory of evolution. The fossil record also doesn't support the case of in-between species, so-called missing links. Artists have a way of painting pictures of their impressions or guesses of what such a missing link would have looked like, but these have, of course, never been found. Uh, these missing links, by the way, in the literature I read an article, they're, they're typically referred to as LCA, all caps, uh, meaning last common ancestor. <laughs> uh, but uh, none have been found in the fossil record. We also know, and he brings this up in a different paragraph, that there are limits beyond which crossbreeding cannot take place. Genesis speaks of creatures bringing forth after their kind. Probably our concept of species, Hebrew word anglicized is M-I-N, men. <laughs> For example, we know we cannot cross a dog with a cow. We can breed a female horse to a donkey. Uh, 60, what is it? No, 34 chromosomes for the horse, 32 for the donkey, and come up with a mule. All right? But the mule, as we know, is sterile and cannot reproduce. That fact creates a major problem for the claimed upward progress of species which evolution needs. Additionally, of course, one has to project gigantic leaps for both a male and a female at the same time or near the same time in the same geographic locale. For example, if there were a leap, say here in Texas, and it was a male, but the leap in a female occurred in England. That wouldn't be of much use because the two could never mate. Uh, and so you have to have uh, in a similar geographic locale at a similar time for even that theory to function. And more faith, in my view, is needed for that than to believe in a God who spoke it into existence. All right, let me pause briefly. Any thoughts up to that point before we begin to look at some of the implications that uh, Lewis suggests come out of believing in creation? Everybody's all happy? All creationist in this room? <laughs> Go ahead. Doesn't just come up with 4004 BC, but he has the month and the day. Oh, really? Well, he, I don't okay. remember what it was, but, but as I recall, he, he got it pretty pretty precise. Okay, there you go. <laughs> yes? Darwin himself admitted that if his base theory was proven wrong, that evolution imploded. Yeah, yeah. Dar Darwin didn't, from what I understand, Darwin didn't get into it the whole issue of faith in God, Thomas Huxley was the one who tried to take it sort of a step further and was in many ways much more radical than probably even Darwin was when he kind of introduced his thinking after visit visiting the Galapagos Islands. But anyway, we know we know where it has ended up in our time. Yeah. You're, uh, you're the odd one out uh, in a science class if you don't believe in it, that's for sure. Yes, but, go ahead. But, you know, even if, even if one were able to prove evolution. Prove it, prove, prove in what sense? Well, even if you were able to prove. Through a scientific that, method? Through a scientific method that there was um, 
some gradual development of complex mm -hmm. life from a single-celled organism. Right. That does not disprove the existence of God. Science still mm -hmm. has not been able to prove that something comes from nothing. Right. And so it might raise questions concerning whether or not we understand the Bible is inerrant, or it may raise interpretive issues, how we interpret the first chapters of Genesis, but that still would not disprove that God exists. I mean, I, I totally agree with you. I don't believe in evolution. I, I think that um, it doesn't match mm -hmm. with, I'm not a scientist, but it doesn't match with what I understand of the world. But, but even if that were to be proven, mm -hmm. there's no reason why that should drive one to the point of being an atheist. Okay. From my perspective. I, I think we ought to acknowledge that there is what uh, I think uh, even believing scientists call micro evolution going on, right. uh, but not macro evolution. And you've got to have macro evolution, which is kind of what we've been talking about here, where you've got uh, things jumping from species to species, and, and that's never been observed or, or and, and never worked. Okay, and most of the mutations, and we're big into mutations now because of the virus mutating, most of those mutations are uh, in the negative category from what I've read, but occasionally one's positive, okay? But again, it's, it, it's random and, uh, and very, very chaotic usually, and uh, as a result, uh, hard to believe that, you know, we could end up with the complicated world that we find ourselves in, all right? And, and the whole timing timing issue of when these things occur, that so many of them have to occur at the same time uh, for it to work, okay? So. See, see Merrill, he's big into intelligent design. He'll give you a video, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Let's look at these implications. Uh, and there may be more than seven, but he grouped them into seven. When we stop to think about it, the biblical teaching of creation carries with it some very weighty implications. Number one, the creator is a part separate from the world he created and sustains. Okay? Um, you know, you, you occasionally bump into a person that wants to say, well, God's in everything. This sort of pantheistic view that deity is in all created things. The answer, clearly from Scripture, is no, that's not the case. God is outside of creation, which is why he's able to speak it into existence. All right? Why he is everlasting and matter is not. Uh, why one day... Uh, it will all end uh, at his timing, okay? Um, and that, that's a, a big issue in my view, all right? Uh, because human beings have a tendency, as we've seen historically, uh, to elevate the creature over the creator, Romans chapter 1, okay? Uh, and if not you know, the creature than some aspect of what the creature does. Uh, I would say for many people in our age, technology is God, okay? AI is God. No, <laughs> okay, it's not, all right? Uh, God is still God, all right? And, and uh, he's sovereign, all right? Number two, idolatry comes as a result of people's failure to recognize the creator, okay? And they do not recognize um, God as creator. Then they believe a lie and began to worship and serve created things rather than the creator. All right. Um, self. I guess we ought to put self in the category. Uh, self has become, for many people, God. All right. Uh, what what I believe, what I want to do, um, what I say is true, that has become uh, idolatry in our time. Number three, the world we live in is God's world. All things belong to Him. He is the ruler, and people and all living things are dependent on Him. All right? And... Uh, 
people in their more honest moments would probably have to admit to that, all right? And yet, man being uh, proud and, and uh, so on would, would like to be uh, the one who determines his own destiny, all right? And uh, the truth is, we really do not, okay? Uh, we live, we breathe, uh, we eat, uh, we have freedom, we, all the things that we have given to us by our Creator. The Creator knows how everything and everyone ought to operate. Okay? Um, clearly, that's an interesting thing to, to ponder, I think. People in our world trying this, trying that, um, often to their own detriment, either psychologically or in many cases physically, um, because they've never read the operator's manual, okay? Uh, and trying, you know, trying to work out life without uh, understanding who made them and, and how it was meant to be, okay? Um, any thoughts on that? David, I was yeah. just a, a very surface thought. Um, I, I would kind of look at it as we live in three quarters secular world, and in one quarter, us coming to church, we come one day a week. So we get. That's one seventh. <laughs> okay. okay. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to get you for that later. Okay. <laughs> so so we, we get way more exposure to, to a secular perspective. And so you really have to, I mean, I'm glad we meet and talk about these things because mm -hmm. it gives us, uh, I guess, perspective. Because you spend so much more time and, and, like you said, these alternative ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. I had a thought, I just don't know where it went. <laughs> <laughs> it has something related to what you said, but I got it my own way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, we just, we get exposed way more to, to all these alternative ways. When you were talking about working out things with our, with our kind of, I guess, uh, more secular perspective, mm -hmm. or, or trying to work it out ourselves mm -hmm. instead of using God's word, we get in a lot of trouble that way. Right. Uh, just recognizing that your perspectives don't come from God's word. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that sounds plain and obvious, but it's not obvious when you're out there. Yeah. You know. I mean, I think a case in point it clearly is one man, one woman in Christian marriage, all right? And you've got society trying it all sorts of different ways, often ending up with uh, love triangles and somebody getting shot yeah. or, or psychological damage. Uh, you know, I mean, everything I read says that people dabble in homosexuality uh, often do not have good mental health, all right? Uh, so... You know, there, there are all sorts of things that, that we could look at that would say, well, you know, when people understand how God made us and how, it, how it's meant to be, uh, then it makes a big difference in, in uh, the way we live life and, and how we feel about ourselves and, and uh, you know, okay? Yes, Vicki. Square peg into a round hole. Okay, it works. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yep. I think so. Uh, wasn't my point, but it was Lewis's. But I've thought about it before. It's a good point, I think. All right. Uh, let's look at number four. If a person is a creature made in God's image, as Genesis one tells us then man's moral and ethical responsibilities are different from those he has if he's merely an animal who is just further developed. The idea of creation makes a lot of difference in what an individual thinks of himself. Is he merely to do what comes naturally, or is he to deny himself and control himself? Okay? Yes? No, I said that one. Amen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
All right. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, the whole idea of ethical responsibility. Some of you maybe have heard me tell this story before. Uh, when I was young, I worked with West University Church in Houston for a couple years, and we had a young young guy from West Texas uh, who uh, was working on a Ph.D. at Rice University. He'd married his high school sweetheart, and in all honesty, let me just say it, she was a pretty homely girl, but she was a hometown girl. Um, as he worked on his degree, she had a high school education. He was getting his PhD. Uh, he started an affair and uh, had grown up in the church. And uh, the next thing I heard him saying was, well, I don't believe in God anymore. And I thought, yeah, okay, that's pra practical atheism. <laughs> knowing full well uh, that what he was doing was not according to God's plan. He was about to divorce his wife, which he did do. Uh, and now he had become an atheist because he didn't want God meddling in his life anymore. All right? And that's where some folks probably are. Yeah? Uh, either they don't want to know what God has to say because then they're going to have a conscience and an issue or, or, or something along those lines. All right? And so we have moral and ethical responsibilities if we really believe that God created us and is uh, in charge. Number five, both men and women were made by God, created equal. Uh, Malachi 2.10 is a little bit of a stretch there, I think, but uh, I would have added, I think, 1 Corinthians 7 as well. And that couples are responsible to God for what they do in the marriage relationship. All right? Um, which kind of reminded me here of uh, couples being equal before God but with different roles. You remember that grand quote by Matthew Henry? The woman was made of a rib out of the side of Adam, not made out of his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled on by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected and near his heart to be beloved. All right? That's not only warm and fuzzy, I think it reflects truth. Okay? Number six, there's equality of people. We human beings are his offspring. Again, from Paul's sermon to the Athenians, some are not made out of better dust than others. There's no master race. People have inalienable rights. And as we know, none of the animals after Adam names them, was able to be a suitable helper, and so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and he created Eve, all right? And in the words of the late, I think it was Carl Burkeen, when Adam saw Eve, he said, wow! <laughs> okay, all right. Number seven, the one who made the earth can call it to an end. What God created, he can destroy. That's the whole language of 2 Peter 3. He did once destroy it in the flood, which Peter brings up in that text. He also confused the languages at the Tower of Babel. Indeed, it's the teaching of Scripture that God will destroy the world in fire. Again, 2 Peter 3. He'll bring creation to his desired end. And so matter will end at that point. And God continues to be eternal. And we have an aspect of us that's eternal. Uh, but we need to take care of that aspect, our soul, uh, by acknowledging God and obeying His word. <laughs>